Hobart was founded about 50 years after the Industrial Revolution had begun. So any ruins that you're going to find in the city itself are going to be at their best of the industrial age. You're not going to get any ancient ruins like you find in countries elsewhere in the world like Greece or Cambodia or Peru. So what we've got here is a train line and it's not the main train line. Come back dog. Come on. It's not the main train line that everyone knows in Hobart. It's the other one. Well, there are a few more actually. There wasn't just one or two, but this is the second biggest one of the last hundred years or so. And it went out to the zinc works that way. It hasn't been used for a long time. And every day thousands of people drive along the Brooker beneath us here. And I guess they see it, but I don't know how much thought goes into what it actually was. Come on, Harry, come on. Train stopped passing across the bridge decades ago. At the time, Zinc Works employees would use it to go to and from work. The same corridor was also used for carrying the acid loading line. Today most of the track has been pulled up. The only people passing here do so on foot. The infrastructure no longer has utility. It's a ruin. But in that way alone, it's interesting. Western civilization's favourite ruins have mostly been Roman, and the interest in them goes back well over a thousand years, but they only really became popular during the Renaissance, as people transitioned from the Middle Ages into modernity. The Adoration of Magi by Botticelli is from 1478, and it depicts the birth of Jesus, but this birth has been moved from the humble stable and into the ruins of a classical building. Artists and scholars at the time came to see themselves as the heirs to the Romans, and as the legacy of the Italian Renaissance spread through Europe, so did a love for ruins. This painting from 1750 by Catherine Reed is entitled British Gentlemen in Rome. Aristocratic families sent their sons to Rome and other classical sites as part of the so-called Grand Tour. And when in Rome, tourists might commission paintings like this. Capriccio of Classical Ruins by Panini from 1730. This 1774 etching by Piranesi is of the Temple of Saturn. It's from his Views of Rome series. So the dog and I are frolicking here in the grass with these old buildings behind us. They're effectively abandoned, although there is a cyclone fence kind of protecting what's left of the place. Once you got through the fence, you'd have to get through the blackberry bushes. After that, well, the glass from the windows are all gone, but there's still mesh covering the windows. But then behind where the glass was, some of the curtains are still there. It's a classic ruin, but what is it? And why hasn't it been completely demolished or completely restored? Today, the people of Lutana have been advised to take precautions when growing vegetables in their gardens. The industrial goings on at the zinc works have, over time, poisoned the soil with lead and cadmium. The area used to be farmland and the greatest farm belonged to the Derwent Park homestead. Built in the 1820s, these barns were part of that property. The 12 room home burned down somewhat mysteriously in 1864. The barn survived but with no prospect of a local harvest. Their spot on the hill is now ornamental. To some people, Ruins can be interesting enough as to want to manufacture them. In 1825, 
King George IV depropriated Roman ruins from Libya and put them in one of his gardens near Windsor. Not a king, but a business mogul, William Randolph Hearst completed his Californian estate in 1949 and he made sure to include classical ruins around his outdoor swimming pool. The appearance of ruins can be appealing for their own sake. In 1975, the Best Products Company built their store in Houston to appear as if it was falling apart. It was a ready-made ruin for shoppers to consume. Intentionally distressed and crumbling ruin structures became part of the post-modern design movement, seen here at the 1986 Goldie Shoe Store at Woodfield Mall. In 1990, the aesthetics of classical ruins were exploited in the sadness video clip by Enigma, as seen in these stills. So we're walking in this very peaceful cove. It's a very peaceful day. There's almost no wind. There's all this industrial age rust here. There's no direct clue on how any of it came to be. It's chaotic. And the reason why it's chaotic is because something went wrong. The dog and I are down here in one of the quiet corners of the Derwent. The zinc works is just across there and it's very noisy, but here it's very still. Beneath our feet, there are the rocks, of course, but there's also a bunch of bones and there's other stuff that's man-made. And looking at it, it looks like there's been an explosion. A bone mill fertilizer factory was built at Shag Bay in the early 1900s. It was a successful business, employing a growing number of people and even going so far as to sell its product interstate. But on the 28th of January, 1915, at 4.30pm, one of the boilers exploded. The noise boomed across the water and up into the hills, disturbing people for miles away. George Russell and his son William, who were at work that day, were both killed. If the accident had not happened, Shag Bay would have, over time, likely expanded and the area of the city would be different now. Instead of a nature reserve, it might well be a large industrial zone, like the one seen on the opposite side of the Derwent, where zinc is smelted today. The English-American artist Thomas Cole made a career depicting ruined locations. This painting from 1836 is titled Desolation. It's the last in a five-piece series called Course of Empire, which traces the rise and fall of an imaginary civilization. All civilizations end in the same position. The ruins of Hobart are not as old or magnificent as others elsewhere in the world, but they still hold meaning. The past is ultimately unknowable, and the future unforeseeable. Ruins cannot always tell you a story, but what they will give you is mystery.